Yuma, what a well-behaved audience. This is terrific, the hubbub settling down. I greet you in the language of deep time in this place, the language of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of Canberra. And we begin, as we do in this country, by honouring that long tradition of skilled scientific stewardship of country and paying our deepest respects to the people who have kept the old knowledge of this country strong to, to the present day and whose knowledge systems, intricate knowledge systems, are the song lines of this ancient continent, constantly renewing, constantly evolving. Thank you so much, Canberrans, for joining us tonight for Planets, Plagues and the Power of Science. I'm Misha Schubert. I'm the CEO of Science and Technology Australia, and it's my very great honour to have been asked to facilitate a compelling conversation between two of the greats of Australian science. Just a quick housekeeping thing to begin. Uh, for some of you who are along the edges of the rows, if you wanted to move into the middle, it'll make it feel cosier and more inviting, like we're sitting around in our lounge rooms, having a lovely chit chat with two brilliant planet-sized intellects. So can I encourage anyone who might want to creep in to do so? Uh, trust me, trust me, it will make it feel, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it'll make it feel like a much more intimate conversation. Uh, and what a treat we have in store for you. Um, Congratulations, Canberrans, on making it out tonight uh, on a cold, uh, rainy Canberra night. This is probably the last time we'll all be out for about a month while we all get over the rude shock of Canberra turning on a cold snap and then realising that actually if we're going to behave that way, we won't get out of our houses again until September. So it's best to just press on and keep going out to important public events. Uh, but it's a delight to see so many of you here tonight. So tonight, I'm reliably informed that you can call two stars a constellation. We have a constellation of Australian science stars uh, to share some ideas with you, to reflect on what it is like to win a Nobel Prize, uh, the Oscars for thinking, as I like to call them, uh, and to share some observations about where we're at uh, in the long sweep of human progress and history, the project that is the contemporary uh, practice of science, and where to from here. So let's jump right on in, and I want you to give a very warm and rousing welcome to Nobel Laureate, Professor Brian Schmidt. <laughs> yes, so good. Welcome, Brian. Good to see you, Misha. Brian, of course, we're not going to deep to <coughs> delve too much into Brian's biography uh, at the outset because I wanted to actually have him retell parts of his story to you. But of course, won the Nobel in 2011 uh, for some really important uh, research about the nature of the galaxy. Uh, he's, of course, on the National Prime Minister's Prime, Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, uh, on the Learned Academies of a gazillion countries, it feels like, uh, and a regular commentator on uh, many media outlets and on Twitter. Uh, and joining us now with the power of the interwebs and contemporary technology should also be Laureate Professor Peter Doherty from Melbourne. Welcome, Professor Doherty. <gasps> it worked, yes. <laughs> Professor Doherty, of course, uh, won his Nobel 26 years ago now um, and is a living national treasure as well. And we're going to have a really terrific conversation between these two stars and preeminent thinkers about some of the big issues that we're wrestling with as a society. So welcome to both of you. Thank you so much. Peter is like a hyper version of himself, so I feel kind of, uh, <laughs> yes. kind of double yes. size. I'm, so. super I'm a bit intimidated looking at it from here. <laughs> So good. So look, the official kind of theme or, or, or organising thought behind tonight's event was to do a couple of things, to bring together these two eminent thinkers to have a chat, but in so doing as well to essentially mark the 10th anniversary of Brian winning his Nobel and the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Australian National University. Now, those of you who are paying close attention to dates and are numerous will realise that the 10th anniversary and the 75th anniversary of these events happened last year, but pandemic, so here we are, slightly behind timetable, but nonetheless pressing on with contemporary life, which feels like a bit of an allegory, doesn't it? Very good. Um, so let's delve right into a, a conversation. And I wondered if we could start perhaps 
thinking about the power of science in the age of COVID. So perhaps, Brian, let's invite you to kick off by talking to us a little about the role of science. What, what do you think its role is in helping us to tackle major crises, the big challenges that come our way as a, as a species and as humanity, um, not just COVID, but things like climate change and antibiotic resistance? Well, if we really think about humanity and the thing that probably most distinguishes us from other species on the planet, is we have the ability to write things down and learn from the past. And one of the things that that allows is science to grow and magnify. You're able to take knowledge, share it, learn, not have to reinvent the wheel each time. Uh, and it gives us this amazing power to go out, understand how things work, predict what might happen if we do something, predict what might happen if we don't do something, and take action. And hopefully that action usually is in our collective benefit, although I think Peter and I can tell you that sometimes humanity takes really stupid decisions based on all the information available. So science is our secret weapon to essentially predict things. And from that prediction comes its power. It is something you can test, you learn from, you iterate, and it's not 100% good, and it's not 100% right, but it is the most effective way of making predictions, uh, and therefore, thereby you know, changing the world based on what happens for the better, and that's why it is so powerful, uh, and it is what distinguishes it from really any other philosophy, if you want to think, that humanity has ever derived. It's, it's essentially something you can test and keep improving. Mm. Peter, do you uh, have further thoughts to add to that? Yeah, well, as Brian said, uh, modern science really begins in the 17th century when, when we had printing and uh, we could publish books and publish journal articles. So it really began with the thinking of uh, a former chancellor of the um, uh, British Exchequer, uh, Francis Bacon, who, um, who formulated the idea that if you want to understand something, you've actually got to look at it and examine it. You just don't think about it, make pontificating statements and uh, say, this is the way it is. Uh, you actually have to do the work and find out how it is. And that's, that's what science is about. Modern science is that you, you do experiments and you, you publish them, you write them up and it goes under peer reviewed uh, 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 scrutiny and then uh, other people can repeat your observations and see if they're right. It's a very, very, very simple set of rules, but it's actually transformed our civilization, our society. But as Brian said, it's had its upsides and its downsides. If we're still back in the 16th century and we were working the way we were then, uh, when uh, large numbers of people died quite young, we wouldn't have a problem with climate change, for instance. So um, basically, as science has changed the world and transformed the world, we absolutely need science to deal with the issues that result and uh, allow us to enjoy the extraordinary lives we live today, where we travel across the planet, where we connect immediately via the internet or via telephone, and uh, we, we live longer and healthier lives than any time in human history. Mm. So science has uh, made enormous changes to us, but it's also been part of the issue of creating the problems that are now really quite compelling, with climate change being the most, uh, the most obvious, and of course what happened with COVID uh, being a very good example of our interconnected, interdependent, and complex world. I'm interested in what both of you have just said there about sort of science being this sort of set of tools to guide us through complex issues and to help us sort of illuminate some of the challenges. How important do you both think the role of sort of public trust and buy-in in science is for whether we, you know, apply those tools and, and put them into the service of humanity? Well, um, if you're going to be effective at using science to make the world better, people do mostly have to trust you. If they burn you at the stake as a witch, uh, you're not going to get very far. So the trust, science doesn't need community trust to occur. And indeed, I think the 
first scientist off and their labs didn't have any community trust at all. They just went out and kind of had a little, their own little cult and moved things forward. But if we're going to go through and take the major problems that society has, whether it is COVID and how do we have public health responses and vaccines and deal with that, there has to be some sort of trust for us to, to work collectively towards solutions which are ultimately global in scale, right? And what happens on the other side of the planet actually affects us. So there has to be this sort of collective agreement that we're going to work together. Uh, and that's true with climate change as well. So trust is important to effectively counter global problems. But if it's local to this room, I can probably do it right now. And you may not like what I'm doing. The audience may be amused. So the science itself doesn't need the trust, but its effective implementation does. Peter, is this the highest level of public trust that you've felt coming off the, you know, the height of the first two years of the pandemic? Well, in, in my particular field, it's, it's both a very high level of public trust, but, but also a certain amount of hostility, which as, as I'm active on Twitter, um, I, I do, do encounter because, uh, you know, that's a discussion format and it's open to everybody. So you have all these conspiracy theories and so forth. But, I mean, people, we, we, our world has been transformed. I mean, Look at the internet and what's that done, what that's done to communication, to, to the role of the journalist, to the role of the scientist, and, and so forth. And it's transformed our world. But it's happened in a, in a kind of a background sense of, of incremental change, where you just buy a new gadget or you log on to a new program. Now, people don't necessarily connect that with science. But of course, it's all a product of science. It wouldn't be there if there wasn't the work of the physical scientists and the engineers and so forth going on in the background. But we don't think of that as science. We just think of that as, oh, something that just happens. So when people think of the role of science in society, some people who are absolutely hostile to science actually use an iPhone, they get on a plane, they get treated when they get sick, and so forth. So, so trying to get that, that communication about the role of science and what science does in society is not necessarily all that easy. Uh, part of it is because the language can often be very complex. Now, with COVID, we've got all sorts of people speaking language that I never thought I'd hear in general use. I mean, just words like epidemiologists. We all, we all know them. I mean, there are so many of them. I'm well, not, not quite sure where they all come from, but uh, they're great. And we love them. We got it. We sometimes. got an online qualification, didn't we? I feel like an epidemiologist now, too. Uh, <laughs> very good. Uh, from All Caps University, I believe, uh, was the issuing institution. Very good. Um, so let's turn to the pandemic then and think about that as a kind of case study in the power of science and that sort of effective guide. Um, Peter, I'm particularly interested in your thoughts as well about what the next couple of years might look like. So what we know from history and what we have observed in the first two years of this pandemic about what we're likely to kind of have to navigate, because it's not over yet, is it? Well, we, we don't really know, Misha. And, you know, I've worked on viruses and immunity for more than 50 years, almost 60 years. And this virus is quite different. And it's behaved very differently. And, uh, and it's given us a lot of surprises. And some of the things we, we thought we knew, we, we don't necessarily know. I mean, there's this kind of reinfection that's happening. Now, because I've worked with virus infections, I've been aware that there are viruses that infect us over and over, unlike influenza, the virus has to change a lot before we get reinfected again. But um, we never really put that much effort into them because the amount of money there is limited. The numbers of people are limited. And, and basically, it's, it's only now that we've been forced to focus on this particular type of virus. Where, where is it going to go? Is, is uh, Omicron that circulating now with its various variants uh, the last stage of this? Will we see these things come back again? Uh, will we, we be hit with another variant that uh, we, just comes out of nowhere? We, we don't really know the answer. Uh, we've learned an enormous amount, I can tell you. We now, uh, over these last two years, we have a much, much better understanding of the human immune system than we, than we ever did because of the resources that have been poured into it. But what do you get out of science and what a country gets out of science is directly related to the resources you put into it, human resources, financial resources. And Australia is not doing all that well on that front. That we've done well through, through COVID because we've, got, we've had a strongly established scientific community in the right area and we have very good institutions. But Australia has not been putting the investment 
in the science and technology that it should be. And it's not ranking very high on the OECD list. Now, Brian will be much more up on that than I am. He's running a university, so he's very conscious of these sorts of issues. Brian, would you like to see a deeper investment in science and technology in our country? Uh, <laughs> well, I do think it's, uh, it is something that Australia needs to get its head around. Uh, we're, Australia has really, over the last 10, 10 to 15 years, become very in the now, inward facing. We've had a huge commodity boom that's made it quite easy. But one of the things I'm trying to get people to think about is the next 50 years. So if you think 50 years ago, 1972, so that was Gough Whitlam, so it's not that long ago for you know people, but there were some major changes made around that time, not all by the Whitlam government, but there was a lot of changes. And Australia has actually prospered from 50 years ago due to a, a large number of decisions made by all sides of government. We are looking very much at a t the time scale of thought right now is, is very short. Science is, is, is not a three month, three year thing. It's a 50 year thing. And some things are absolutely never really stand the test of time. You wouldn't think to spend money, but many things do. And that science needs to be invested in people's education so that we can ensure that Australia is prosperous in the future or, you know, we will just fade away because at some point the rents that we get from the resources will become less over time than they are right now. And that means our lives will be less prosperous. And so we do need to invest in that and not just ask the question, which can I say politicians always ask in every country, but here they really follow through on, which is give me a national interest test that says why what you are doing right now is useful for the Australian people right now. And that, that turns out that is commercialization. That is not science. That's commercialization and translation. It's important, but you need to have the foundation bits of knowledge that uh, underpin that uh, so that you have the ideas to translate. So, you know, we're in the middle right here at ANU of, of actually putting a lot of effort into making sure our scientists, when they have the good ideas, are able to translate them. So that's room, room temperature quantum computers. Well, that comes from basic science that had no national interest to it when you did it. We have people developing the technology to essentially break down plastics into monomers, their, their, their constituent parts. Again, really basic research no commercialization in that. And you can go on and on. We can talk, Peter can talk around the uh, mRNA vaccines, and that was basic research again. Peter's own work on, on T cells, which don't seem to be doing a very good job right now since we keep on getting <laughs> reinfected. Uh, that's Everyone's basic research, critic, huh? right? But it's, it's really important in understanding yep. um, uh, vaccines and, 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 and health more generally. So you do need to invest in this. Uh, we seem to have very clear an idea our, in, our, in our head how much we should be investing as a government in defense. Uh, we seem to have a much less good idea of how much we should be investing in research. And research has been declining. It reached a peak total investment across the sector of about 2.3% of our GDP within a year. That compares to the U.S., which is three and a bit, Korea, which is five, Israel, which is five. And it's dropped now to about 1.7% uh, of GDP, uh, and it's falling. And should I say, if you're worried about strategic issues, during that time, China has passed us and is now up to 2.3, 2.4%, having, when I started as vice chancellor, been down at 1.6 or 1.7. Mm -hmm. uh, my home country, the United States, bipartisan support for research, because they see it very much as essential to the future of the United States. I would love for people here to realize it's actually for the future of us too. Mm. Such an important point about that. Yes, 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 yes. Indeed. Uh, such an important point about that role of, um, well, we, we, I, every time I hear the term basic research or basic science, I always feel like we need to rebrand it to discovery because it sort of it feels like basic is sort of underselling it. Um, but you're right, that, fr that frontier, 
non-applied research that's led to some of those biggest seismic breakthroughs uh, in the course of history. I'm going to invite you both in a minute to sort of start unpacking a little bit about the, the research for which you were both, uh, for you, which we were each awarded your Nobels. But I just wanted to just quickly, before we close off on the pandemic, um, hear from you both a little bit about risk mitigation and how you approach managing risk. Um, so, Peter, you know, part of the challenge, I think, of kind of two years and a bit into the pandemic is about those calculations each of us feel we're making every day about risk mitigation. Yeah. Talk to us about the kinds of calculations you are making with the wealth of knowledge you have around <laughs> uh, immunology about your own health and safety and, and community health and safety and how you sort of navigate that. Yeah, there are sort of very basic things to the scientific life. And, and basically, uh, particularly in medicine, you think in terms of probability and relative risk. I mean, that's what it's all about. Uh, we know, it, you know, the vaccines sometimes can give you some bad consequences, but the relative risk of re the vaccines compared with catching the infection is, is vastly skewed in the favour of being vaccinated. This, this is not thinking that pervades the, the general community, but it's though it has much more, I think, since the pandemic started. So I think this is where we need to be really firming things up in schools and so forth, is getting this sort of consciousness of everything as a relative risk equation embed, embedded in people's minds. Now, I'm 80 plus years old, so I'm at relative risk, at a higher relative risk from bad consequences than from, co than co from COVID than someone who's 20 or 30 years older, which is the reason I'm actually not in Canberra and still sitting in Melbourne, because Omicron's circulating out there, and even though I'm heavily vaccinated, you can still get quite sick from it. So I think uh, for a lot of us, the COVID experience has changed those perceptions, but whether those perceptions stick or not is, is another matter. The, I mean, science does make you think in very particular ways that aren't necessarily the ways that the general, general people in the general community approach life. And, and uh, that's part of the problem with science communication is we, we tend to think everybody thinks like us, but they don't, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, you're um, you know, making some of those calculations that we're all making every day, similarly around um, you know, where our risk tolerances are, um, but you're also the Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University, where you're responsible for the health and safety of you know, a, a very large number of people who um, come into this uh, institution and are educated here. Tell us a little bit about how you've approached managing risk you know, at, as the head of an institution like this, armed with your science knowledge uh, through this pandemic? Yeah, and so I basically apply the same probabilistic uh, way of thinking of things that Peter talks about. And the first thing for me is to make sure I have access to the best information. And Peter and I have chatted several times over the last couple of years. I've called him up and said, all right, Peter, tell me what you think. Uh, and I do that because Peter has access um, to a whole world of information and he can synthesize it into a language that I, as a physicist, can understand in terms of into probabilities and stuff. And I have literally relied on Peter, uh, probably more than he realizes, uh, for, for some of that information, especially in the first year when I was trying to figure out what, how this was going to track. Uh, you have to then overlay that with a and U as an institution and the people in it. So I have professors like Peter who have, you know, 80, 80 plus year old immune systems. And Peter tells me very clearly that an 80 year old immune system really sucks compared to what even a 50 year old <laughs> immune system does. Uh, and you should not treat people who are 80 the same as 50 because the, the relative risk is not a factor of a couple. It's, it's, it's orders of magnitude higher. So, you know, back in November, I was trying to figure out what was happening and we made the decision, I made the decision that for the well-being of my students and my staff, I needed to do everything I could to have classes and a community on, on that. And that was a decision I said, I want to I try to achieve, but I have to, do, I have to keep people safe. What do I need to do to keep people safe? Immunization has to be really high, but I also know that people react badly when you say you must be immunized and you actually get lower immunization rates than if you just strongly encourage them and give them lollipops afterwards. So that's a piece of public, public health advice, right? 
I also know that high quality masks, an N95 mask, which if you're at ANU, you got five of them, you can go get five more. And I distributed them for free, so no one had an excuse. And it also set an N95 mask, is what everyone's wearing, maybe you should wear one as well. And I know that that, if you have two people, everyone wearing N95 masks, that you can really knock down the transmission. Finally, I knew ventilation was serious, so here we're in a, in a venue that turns the air over completely within about an hour. That's a very ventilated room, so you are in actually a surprisingly safe space here relative to the average place uh, in, in Australia. And we opened up and we went through and reprogrammed all the ventilation, and then I gave away free rats to everyone and said, no excuse for not having a rat. If you think you're sick, take one and stay away if you, you think you have it. So we tried to go through and say, oh, those are all the things I had control of. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, I knew that I will have made ANU a much safer place than any place else in people's lives. So that I can't stop people from getting COVID and transmitting it, but it was very much more likely for people to transmit and catch COVID off campus, probably like an order of 100 higher than on campus. And we've seen that. There's almost no transmission on campus. I won't say it's zero, but it's close enough to zero. It is, you know, and it's a by the numbers thing. And you add all these numbers up and you eventually get something where you can actually slow the transmission down on campus. Mm -hmm. And that means our staff and our students feel safe. Uh, and uh, we're able to go with the painfulness of having a mask. I hate them. But on the other hand, if it can keep people like Peter safe when they're up uh, teaching, then that's important to me. Terrific. Um, one of the special things about the Australian National University is that uh, in addition to these two distinguished stars uh, who were Nobel laureate, awarded their Nobels uh, at the time that they were at ANU, there are four others. If any of you can name them, there will be a prize. That's uh, one of the chubba chops that Brian uh, has identified as a key motivational technique. Uh, Lord Howard Florey for the discovery of penicillin in 1945. Sir John Eccles in 1963 for his discovery about how electrical pulses control nerves. Professor John Hassani, who won a laureate in 1994 for his pioneering work on economic game theory. And Professor Rolf Martin Zinkernagel, uh, who in 1996 shared the Nobel Prize with Peter for their revolutionary work in immunology. So I just wanted to, if I could get both of you to just refresh us, pretend we aren't all over the uh, full details of exactly what the research was for which each of you were awarded a Nobel and remind us about what was known in the field of knowledge in your area at the time before your work uh, was recognised as well. Peter, do you want to go first? Well, I, I guess our work was done earlier. I mean, Rolf Sinkenagel and I were a couple of young guys in a small lab in the old John Curtin School of Medical Research. I'd been in Britain and I'd been working, I'm, I'm a veterinarian by basic training, I've been working on virus infections in sheep, a disease called Laupin encephalitis. I got very interested in the inflammatory cells that go into tissues when we get an infection. And everybody now knows about inflammation. I mean, you, you wouldn't have got a very good discussion on that a few years back. So I got very interested in what these cells were. And I, I was looking at the cells out of the, at ANU, where I, the first time I'd been in a really um, first class academic research environment, uh, we were looking at the cells we were getting out of the brains of mice infected with a virus called lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. Uh, we were looking at what we call killer T cells. And we, could, we found that the cells, uh, I found, the cells I could get out of these brains really killed the hell out of uh, virus infected cells in a lab dish. Rolf, Rolf turned up and we started to work together and uh, we did what was called a cytotoxic T cell assay and, and we discovered that killer T cells from one strain of mouse wouldn't kill virus infected cells from another strain. And, and what we discovered out of that, after a lot of experiments that are very complicated, but drew on the mouse genetics that have been dis developed to discover, to, to understand transplantation by people over the last 30 years before that, uh, that the killer T cells were working through what we call the transplantation system, the, the transplantation proteins on the surface of our cells. So, so what, it, what it told us is how these cells were focused and targeted onto virus-infected cells. And their job, viruses can only grow in living cells, right? Mm -hmm. 
So their job was to destroy these virus-infected cell factories within us. So what we actually discovered was how these things work, and we discovered why it is we have this transplant system, and it's there for the, what we call the immune surveillance of cells. Now, this, this, these experiments were done with very, very primitive systems in a tiny lab, two, little, two guys working together uh, with one technician in labs that were only meant to hold four or five people. Now... I mean, a research, a minimal sized research group for biomedical science is probably about six to eight people. It, it's a totally different world, totally transformed. I'm, I'm part of the living fossil record of my subject. <laughs> uh, you know, I plugged away at it for a number of years, and, and as smart young people came in the lab, and we changed the technologies, we did more sophisticated experiments. And basically, the type of thing we kicked off back in 1972, 73, 74, at the ANU has now really defined how the cellular immune response is working in COVID. And, and there's a lot of fantastically good science being done. Some of it being done by people who work with me early on in their careers. So I'm really proud of that. Awesome. I love the cheeky upstart culture. Yes, yes. I love the, the size of that achievement, but also the cheeky upstart culture of two blokes in a lab just doing <laughs> revolutionary frontier science. So good. Um, Brian, you came to Australia in 94 as a newly minted postdoc, and you came here because you wanted to work on exciting frontier research. Tell us about where your research led you and, and the, the research that actually uh, was the subject of your citation for your Nobel. So yeah, in 1994, I had just recently finished my PhD, and my PhD was on uh, measuring how fast the universe was expanding. So the universe is getting bigger in all directions, and the question is, how fast is it getting bigger? And if you know that, you can run the universe in reverse and figure out how old it is. So I was helping measure the age of the universe, and so my answer was 14 billion years, which turns out to be just about right, uh, although it took a lot of other people working on it as well, so we got a consensus on the value. It was a very uh, heated topic from 1929 when Edwin Hubble first had the concept of it. So my pitch to come to ANU, and I want you to, so I was at Harvard, and you'd say, why would you come to ANU from Harvard? Well, because ANU at the time was considered to be a better astronomy department than Harvard. So for me, it was a very good job. And my pitch to uh, get my job here is I was going to use the new technology to do the measurement in the nearby universe and go to further and further and further objects and measure how fast the universe was expanding back in time. Why would I want to do that? Because as the universe expands, Gravity slows it down. And I could weigh the universe uh, by measuring how fast the universe slowed down in, uh, over time, and hopefully figure out whether or not the universe was going to slow down, stop, and go in reverse, and have the Ganab Gib, the Big Bang backwards, or whether or not it was just going to expand forever. So that was my pitch. Okay? Uh, and Unlike Peter, who had the pure luxury of two people in the lab, I was it. <laughs> so good. Even but, more. Even but, more, I think. Exactly. <laughs> luxury. So I, uh, but I did have a team of colleagues from around the world. So there were roughly 20 of us. And I, as a 27-year-old, was given the freedom to work on this program. We decided collectively as a team, with a few ins and outs along the way, that even though I was like the second youngest person on this 20-person team, since it was my idea and started it, I could run it. And I was given $8,000 for some international travel, and that Ooh. was basically what I then did three years worth of work with a lot of help from people around the world. Uh, and we made our measurement back in time. And what we found is in the past, the universe was expanding slower than the present, not faster, and it had not slowed down, it had in fact sped up. And that speeding up of the universe indicated that gravity, for whatever reason, was pushing rather than pulling. And you say, well, that's crazy. Yeah, that's what I thought. I figured I must have made a mistake. But we checked our work many, many times. And it turns out in 1917, Einstein, as he always did, had come up with the solution for this, which is that if energy is spread evenly, and I mean absolutely evenly across the cosmos, in his equations of general relativity, 
the universe will be pushed by gravity rather than pulled. And so our discovery meant that 70% of the universe had to be something we did not know about, dark energy. We still don't really know what it is, except for it's energy everywhere. But interestingly enough, it means that the universe is speeding up like a epsilon uh, COVID outbreak, except for unlike COVID, it doesn't stop. It just keeps exponentially growing. And that means the universe is not going to end with the Gnad Gib. It is going to get bigger and bigger, faster and faster, and end in a whimper, kind of puffs out where it just becomes all dark and incredibly boring uh, trillions of years in the future. Oh, there you go. Amazing, right? Cool. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He just to be clear, yeah. Peter's Nobel Prize may save your life. <laughs> Mine assures that you will not live forever. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you also save someone's life eventually. Uh, yes, good. No, no, it'll, it assures that everyone does. Yes, indeed. Great. So good. I'm also interested in hearing a bit more about what the mechanics of this thing are. So you've done this bit of incredibly brilliant frontier research and you, you know, you think it's pretty important. You think it might have set this sort of new, um, you know, established knowledge now for peers around the world to build off of. How do you know on, uh, that you're being considered for a Nobel? And uh, what's, what's that moment like? How does it actually, what's the transaction when someone lets you know that this has actually happened to you? Tell us, take us, in, take us back into the intertime. I'm curious to find out how it worked for you, Peter, yeah. because I don't think I've ever heard this story. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, basically, we're, we're going way back in biology. I mean, Brian's, Brian's a physicist, and, you know, they're very smart people. And Alfred Nobel puts them first on the stage because they're the smartest people in the universe, and they clearly are. And um, but so, so, but basically, biology is different, and biology has changed incredibly since we made that discovery. And, and that's because of the pervasive changes that have been induced by molecular science. And, 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 and we, we're just doing things now we couldn't have possibly contemplated doing years before. Now, that's certainly true, true of physics too, I guess. I mean, with improved measurement systems and all the rest of it. But just our whole approach to biology has been transformed. And uh, when we made that discovery, we, we came up with a kind of theoretical interpretation for it and suggested what was happening. And basically, we couldn't prove it because the technology wasn't there. Within 10 years, the technology was there. The results came through. And we'd made some really good guesses. So we, we made a discovery. We described a new phenomenon. We convinced people that something very different was going on. But a lot of people didn't believe our explanation. And, and then other people came along and showed, yeah, these guys basically got it right. Their explanation's right. So, um, so we waited for the Nobel Prize. I didn't, we didn't think we'd get it, actually, because we'd really discovered what the transplant system was for. And there was a Nobel Prize in 1980, um, some five or six years after we'd done our basic work and put forward this theory, which, which was for histocompatibility. And for one of the guys actually claimed our work as uh, sort of uh, uh, as part of his, his grand design. So we thought, you know, we're out of this league. And we didn't think about it anyway. You don't do science because you want to win Nobel Prizes. You do science because you're driven by it. You're driven by curiosity, uh, the, the sort of, this sort of science. And, and you, you're really trying to understand what's going on. And with biology, that's very complex and very messy. Messy, biology is messy. I mean, physics isn't. It's clear. It's clean. It, it's very nice. It's, it's nice here. But biology is a mess. And it's a mess because it's driven by evolution. So it doesn't... The, the basic laws of physics are there right at the very basics of the chemistry of it. But really, you, you can't really predict what's going to happen because biological systems evolve and they build on earlier systems because that's where their starting point is. So it's not, not the optimum solution. It's the solution that's possible. It's, it's as though you, you build all your new buildings on old foundations with, to some extent, your, the design of your building being de de defined by those foundations. Mm. So, so biology keeps throwing up new things all the time because they're specific to a particular biological system. So uh, anyway, our, our sort of thinking became more and more pervasive and, and really what happens as your thinking becomes more and more pervasive in a subject, you get forgotten because you become what's called incorporated. <laughs> that is, you become part of the general story that everyone knows. 
So we, I, I didn't think we were going to win a Nobel Prize, and I never thought much about them anyway. And I didn't know much about them, really. And then we, uh, we picked up a prize called the Lasker Award in 1995. The Lasker Basic Science Award, awarded in the United States, it's their most prestigious medical research prize. And I, I was made aware at that time when we got the Lasker that half the people who win the basic Lasker award then go on to win a Nobel Prize. Well, you know, I'm from Queensland and I started as a vet. So my natural interpretation was, well, half the people who win the Lasker award don't win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> and the next year at four o'clock in the morning, we're living in Memphis, Tennessee of all places, working in a wonderful, wonderful place so called St Jude Children's Research Hospital. Uh, we got up at four o'clock in the morning and my wife Penny picked up the phone. We thought that something had gone wrong with all the older family back in Australia. She picked up the phone and a voice said, this is Nils from the Nobel Foundation. And she said, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Excellent, very good. Brian, what was that like for you? Were there people sort of making surreptitious inquiries about uh, situating your work in the sweep of knowledge and then was there a call in the middle of the night? Uh, so, I mean, we knew when we made this discovery that it was probably wrong, so I was where I started with, right? <laughs> and then over time you realise it's not going to go away and after the first couple of years, you know, it starts becoming real. And, and but the problem I had with my discovery is we just, how, how are we going to understand this stuff we call dark energy? There's no way of testing it or, so it's a real, it's a really an enigmatic result. That was a huge mystery, but it just seemed a little airy-fairy to me to worry about prizes of this magnitude. So yeah, some people talked about it, but I will be honest, it was not something I paid much attention to. Uh, I grew up in Montana and Alaska, and you know, winning a Nobel Prize was never on my radar. And like Peter, didn't know that much about it. I met a couple Nobel Prize winners. That was kind of cool. I was pretty excited when I met them, uh, including him. Uh, and, uh, when I, I remember I was giving a talk at the Academy when I won my first Academy Prize, and Peter was in the audience, came and had a little chat with me and uh, uh, grilled me a little bit on a couple of, of the points at the time. And that was a big deal to me that Peter Doherty had that conversation with me. Uh, so wasn't really expecting too much, uh, if I can be honest. And while I won some astronomy prizes and things, astronomy is the biology of physics, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's messy. Uh -huh. It's not, it's not, it's very rarely something you keep repeating the experiment and you get, you get one go, which is whatever you know, the universe gives you. And so it is quite challenging to, to, to get the really clear results that physicists love. Uh, but in my case, uh, in 2011, on, you know, in October, at, conveniently at 8.39 uh, p.m., because I remember it well, we're in a better time zone than Peter was, uh, uh, we were in, my wife, Jenny, answered the phone, and she looked very puzzled. And I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I don't know, I think it may be a crank call. Uh, <laughs> so good. And, and this young woman with a Swedish accent said, is this Brian Schmidt? And I said, yes, this is Brian Schmidt. And then she said, are you sure this is Brian Schmidt? <laughs> Because this is a very important call from Stockholm, from, from Sweden. And I'm sitting there, and I, I said, is my PhD student, who some of you will know, Brad Tucker, uh, is he playing a practical joke on me? <laughs> because he had had a conversation with me earlier that day when he gave me his wedding invite, which was the 10th of December. They said, when they call you up today, tell them you're busy. <laughs> And so I was sure this was a practical joke. And so I said, as one does, uh, when they said, you know, uh, is this, uh, uh, you know, is this really Brian Schmidt? I said, I, I, I'm sure that it is an important call from Stockholm. Uh, and then so a physicist got on who I actually knew. And then I'm like, oh my God, this is getting serious. Uh, and yeah, they just kind of said, well, we're going to announce it in, it was now probably 41, 841 in four minutes. It was announced at, 8.45 and bam, 
It just happens, and so you don't really know what's going to happen, and your life is rather upended, as Peter can tell you. Yeah. It's kind of hits you like a freight train, and Peter had the grace of being a few years older than me. I was 44 when I got the call. I love everything about that story, especially Brad Tucker's epic role in trolling you through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah I think we should applaud that. So good. Um, I, I did also get, a, get told, Brian, as well, it's in a, in a hallmark of your humility that uh, when the first of the ANU staff reached you that evening to say, well, let's get you prepped for media interviews, um, and I have promised him, uh, I won't reveal his identity, so let's just call him Martin Pierce, uh, said that they said, you know, this is amazing, you know, incredible, incredible. Uh, and your response was, yeah, it's, it's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> what are you supposed to say? That I know. Catches you on unaware. Love it. So good. So um, in terms of how it does upend your life, but also open doors to opportunity, or give you a platform then to use your public voice for good, how is it? How has the winning the Nobel done that for each of you in your respective fields of endeavor? Well, I think Peter should answer first because when I won mine, I called him up about two days later <laughs> and said, how on earth did you use your Nobel Prize so effectively because I have no idea how to cut through in this country on science. So I think, Peter, you, I think you were the master of it back then. Well, well, well we tried and, and it was the time Howard had, John Howard had just won one government, just coming to government. He was, he was delighted by it. And uh, we were, after the announcement, the announcement is always made on the first Monday in October for the medicine prize. Mm -hmm. And uh, the physics is actually announced a bit later, uh, medicine's first. Um, we were just due to come out to Australia for my, uh, my, my son and daughter-in-law's wedding, in fact. So, so we were out in Australia before December 10 when the prize is awarded. It's always awarded on the anniversary of Alfred Nobel's death. So when I got out here, and uh, I was talking at the Australian Academy of Science and all the rest of it, and uh, living in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, John Howard arranged for an event on the floor of the new Parliament House, which was very gracious of him, and, uh, and uh, I think, uh, and, the, and, and so it was a, kind of good for them, you know, he just got into government. Here's a Nobel Prize from Australian science. And um, basically then uh, um, the Nobel was coming up, but what happened was uh, in early December, after the prize, I got a call from Australia saying, you've just been made the Australian of the year. And I said, what the hell is that? And uh, <laughs> basically it was different. Uh, a different mechanism then. It was a committee that sat in Sydney and uh, they had a few good bottles of Grange or something like that because wine, <laughs> wine making, Brian wasn't into wine making at that stage. And uh, they had to choose someone and then they could get on with the drinking. And if you won a Nobel Prize, they always chose you. The very first one was Marlon Burnett who won the Nobel Prize back in 1960. And I said, yeah, well, that, that's great, but I've got a very busy year ahead. You know, the year <laughs> after you win the Nobel is, is intense to say the least. And I said, can I put it off for a year? And they said, well, well, no, if you want to ever come back to Australia, you better do this. Yeah. And so, so I did. I mean, I, we, we came out to Australia three or four times and were speaking all across the country. And I was suddenly finding that as I'd won a Nobel Prize, I knew everything. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'd been asked about everything from climate change to, to herbal medicines. And, and you know, I'm thrown into the deep end, totally inexperienced, making a complete fool of myself at times. But I actually caught on fairly quickly. And Howard was great. Howard actually doubled the medical research budget twice, I think, through his tenure and, uh, and also the Australia Research Council. So Howard really liked science. So he's a great friend of science and, and really cared about it. Uh, but it's fallen on somewhat harder times since. So that started me off on public communication, speaking to large groups of people, very diverse, and understanding that where I was coming from wasn't where they were coming from, and quickly adapting uh, to what um, to what they uh, they needed they needed to try and get from me. And that started me off on science communication. So even though I was, I was heavily involved uh, in the research side for another decade or more, I, I got more and more into the public communication stuff. And, uh, and that's led to a, a number of articles and things. And um, now eight books, the eighth one will be coming up in, in um, August. 
uh, though it's not on science, actually, yeah. and, uh, and activity now on Twitter, which is another, another whole story and way of life. So how effective I've been, that was another matter. I mean, our science budgets haven't been increasing. They've been falling in relative terms. So, so it's a very difficult call, and, uh, um, um, but one tries. Indeed, one does try. Uh, and um, we'll, we'll come back to Twitter in the public square in just a minute because it's an excellent uh, exhortation, uh, light, of, light of further conversation. But Brian, for you as well, you also had an audience with a PM and you insisted on going and giving your lecture the next day, which miraculously tripled its enrolment size, I gather. Um, and what was that sort of, how, what was your thinking about how you wanted to use that prize to essentially do some important things for the public good? Yeah, so uh, as I said, I did call up uh, Peter to try to understand how he managed to get in, and he said you, you had a, uh, a, a good connection with John Howard and one of his advisors, very key. So trying to figure out how to, to do that in Australia, and, and I did get a chance to have discussions, um, as I said, with the Prime Minister of the day, it was Julia Gillard. Um, her tenure didn't last that long afterwards, so it became a little, the politics became a little messier than, uh, you know, 10 years of stability. But uh, I did want to make sure that we highlighted science to young Australians as something that was both worthwhile to do, interesting, uh, great career choice if that's what you want to do. Uh, so I worked on things like primary connections was uh, a program to teach science in uh, kindergarten through sixth grade that the academy did, and it was about to be axed. So I went through and I donated my uh, $50,000 of my prize to it, thereby making the minister of the day unwilling to ax it. Uh, so that was a very tactical move. I don't think... Uh, Yes, uh, the minister of the day has completely forgiven me based on, he's one of my alums, a very famous singer, <laughs> Peter Garrett. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, anyway, so that was, that was uh, he had to cough up another four million, so my 50,000 got multiplied by four million. Uh, but it was a good thing because Primary Connections is still used today, it's still a great program. Yeah. Uh, I did a lot of talks, I mean I did like 200 talks in that first year. Uh, my talks were not just here in Australia, they were around the world, and I used it as an opportunity to try to highlight Australia on the global stage as best as I could. Amazing. Um, the, just Peter's exhortation as well about Twitter makes me want to just quickly delve into a little bit about the role of science communication in the public square in an era that feels increasing, increasingly shouty and um, uncivil, perhaps, sometimes in the public discourse. And I wonder, um, both of you are active on Twitter, and you don't just, it's not a, you don't view it as a one-way broadcast platform. You are actually out there engaging and commenting and answering questions from the public. Why do you do that? Why do you feel such a responsibility to do that, each of you? Well, it's interesting because Peter and I work on Twitter almost, this most, he's the most similar person that I know of, mm. and we sort of did it on our own separately. Uh, and I guess for me, I want to go and not just get on the podium and shout at people. I am trying to have a conversation with the people who really don't get science and trying to, to get at least a little foot in the door for some enlightenment. And that means not telling people they're idiots, but rather having a real conversation with people who disagree with you. Now, uh, it's, it's a little intense out there sometimes, and some people are just disrespectful, and you just have to, you know, mute is great, because then they just shout into the ether, and they don't know. It's great. Every other one can watch them, but you have no idea that's going on. So a great feature mute on Twitter. Uh, and Peter, as near as I can tell, uh, just observing you, you, you have a fairly similar way of doing things, as near as I can tell. Yeah, yeah you've got to treat everyone with respect. I mean, if people are uh, outright abusive, I, I tried early on to engage with them and try and talk to them, but if, you know, if they continue being abusive, you just block them and get rid of them out of your consciousness. But uh, Twitter is a bit of a problem with Twitter, is, is you, you become a bit of an echo chamber and you talk more and more to like-minded people. I, I was using it very much. I mean, before COVID started, I had 18,000 Twitter followers. I think I now have 110,000. 
No, there are several reasons for that, including an inappropriate tweet of mine very early on. But um, basically... Uh, Went past me in the, one uh, day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I was the Twitter yeah, I, king in Australia of Nobel Prize winners. And <laughs> Peter talked yeah, about yeah. Dan Murphy's, and bam, he was past me in 24 hours. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I, I had Google and Twitter open and my email all open on the computer at the same time. I got confused and I asked for Dan at Murphy's opening hours in Twitter. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that kind of humanised me because, unfortunately, the, the, my publisher who had set me up with a Twitter account had put prof in front of my name and I hadn't thought about it. I should have tweeted as, uh, you know, without that. Uh, but but there I was, and uh, and so but, but basically it was very useful to I was able to reassure people about vaccination and answer some of the questions about COVID and 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 try and generally try to answer questions and and if people came in and they were hostile I I try to gauge really whether you know maybe I can just give them a better view of this and you try to do that it, it's it's different though I mean in science we get a very good idea of where we stand as far as communicating, because our, our papers are referenced, that's all recorded. We even know the numbers of people who reference our papers and all the rest of it. So there's all sorts of metrics. But in public communication, you never know uh, where things go. You do know how many times it's retweeted or whatever on Twitter, but, but you never quite know where things go and what impact it has. But what I've been doing over the last five or six days is tweeting very strongly about make sure you're enrolled to vote because the voter rolls changed closed at 8 p.m. last night. And I just read a thing online saying they've had the highest enrolment uh, yesterday any time in Australian history of en people enrolling to vote. So if I had any influence on that, I'm yes. very pleased. Yeah, so good. Yeah. Thank you. And Peter, again, can I say I was watching Peter do this, and Peter was, of course, attacked for doing this by various people on yeah. there. Uh, yes, yes. But I almost went to your defense and I decided you could fend yourself, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we've got to do a, a different act, Brian. We should never be, never be together on this so we can pick up different things and so forth. So, but, you know, we, we've got very much, very common interests. I mean, I'm very interested in climate change, so is Brian. Mm -hmm. And Brian, Brian's expertise comes from the physical sciences, which is all about the causes of climate change and why we're seeing this. And my expertise all comes from the, the, the other end, the effect of climate change, the effect of climate change on us. And because that's what matters uh, really to all of us. I mean, you know, there's a lot of geologists, for instance, saying climate change is not important because the rocks will do fine, but <laughs> we're all dead. That's not yeah. very satisfying. Yeah. So good. Indeed. So we are really running out of time, but I just wanted to quickly get you both to just uh, expand a little more on the urgent challenges of climate change. Um, you know, how you, how you see the challenges ahead and what you're most worried about before we kind of come back out at a happy pinnacle of something else a bit more uplifting to, to finish us off on. Um, Peter, do you want to pick up on, on that? How worried are you and what, what are you most worried about? Yeah, I, I'm very concerned. I mean, COVID has shown us how well an Australian governments, including a, a, you know, a pretty conservative government who's not really into a lot of governing, actually, quite frankly. I mean, they, don't, they, they want to have government so they don't have to govern. But basically, uh, they responded well to this and they responded and they had Keynesian economic solutions to it and, and they really did a pretty good job. And I'm talking about federal government and all the state governments as well and people bought into it and they did a good job. So, and it gave me a much better sense of Australia being the Australia I grew up in, which was the Australia after World War II when there was a very much a sense of shared fates and, and collective responsibility. I thought we'd lost a lot of it. But it came back again with COVID and, and it, it came back to a greater extent in this country than so it did in the United States, which has a very different cultural hit, tradition and history. So I, I, I'm really pleased by that. But at the same time this was going on, the, the, the government was legislating and making initiatives that actually make us more dependent on fossil fuels and, and expanding fossil fuel exports and expanding fossil fuel discovery. And, and so that's been deeply depressing. And it's, it's a really good indication of the way the human condition works. We're really good at responding to acute challenges. We can pull together uh, like a wartime footing when there's an acute challenge and we have to tackle it. Tackling something long-term, 
and difficult and complex is very difficult for us. And I'm just not sure how, how we're going to go with this. Uh, we just have to do our best and we have to just keep trying, keep trying, no matter what the reversals and so forth. Because I think it can, technology can do a lot, but what it's going to take if we're really going to change, uh, tackle climate change is a lot of us changing what we value and how we do things. And changing values, changing behaviour is something that Australians or people in general really don't like doing. Whereas in science, we live with change all the time. We know, we know things are changing. We know things are evolving. We know we can't stick with, with a set set of attitudes. But again, that's not pervasive in the society. Brian, did you have some additional thoughts on the challenges where we're going to start to, to see and live through? So, yeah, I mean, I find uh, climate change and the whole basic idea of sustainability on a planet that, you know, has a, a size that it has, not getting any bigger, I'm afraid. Due to my discovery, it stays very much the same size. So, we, we have this race. We have a race of, you know, uh, population increase on, on the planet, and we know that if you get people rich enough, fast enough, their fertility will drop. You can also get rid of people by everyone dying in cataclysmic events. So those are sort of A and B. Uh, I, I prefer A, uh, which is not the cataclysm. But it's a real race because right now, of course, the wealthier you are, the more you, know, you consume. And this is particularly true when it comes to greenhouse gases uh, and things that are causing climate change. The fact that Australia, which I would judge to probably have the most resources in terms of uh, renewable energy, so if, if when the transition occurs, Australia is probably the country that is going to benefit economically the most of any advanced economy in the world. We have the richest resources. The fact that we are the big laggard simply because we happen to have certain resources of gas and coal right now, I just find bewildering. But there is a political solution, which is you got to bring people along. You need to invest in the technological solutions where the change is going to occur. So, you know, if you're going to have a big uh, new hydrogen plants and green steel and stuff, you need to put them in places like Wyala and Newcastle and Wollongong and places that are affected. And they're not absolutely the most economic, perfect solution for that, but they make sense because they are allowed to politically occur. But what I pe think people fail to think about is what happens if this does not occur. If we do not occur, yeah, Australia will, you know, have more floods, more fires, and our life will slowly decay. But the billions of people around us will have their lives collapse. And instead of having a million refugees, you're going to have a billion refugees. And we will not survive that. We will be overrun, and our lives will be destroyed. And this thinking that we somehow are going to be, it's not going to affect us, is just crazy. The entire planet is on this together. And it's a big system we need to think about. And as Peter says, we've got to keep trying it. Because, you know, the question to my mind is, I'd love to keep things below two degrees. I'm more worried about them going to four, five, six. And, you know, you want to use a lot of uh, greenhouse gases, get into a war. Then you really use greenhouse gases very quickly because that's how it's going to be done. So that's another, you know, feature. As things become unstable, the whole thing is going to crumble with war, with you know, all sorts of other things if we let it go that way. So we must work on it. We must work on it now. And Australia is a lucky country. We are going to become possibly the richest country on the planet if we actually achieve that goal. So we should be working faster than anyone on it. And it just amazes me we don't. No. Uh, we are over time, but I've been finding this conversation so terrifically enjoyable. Um, but I wanted to just finish on a, on a high note uh, and perhaps invite you both to share some thoughts about um, what we need to do to safeguard science and technology and their capabilities for humanity for the long haul <clears throat> and what your advice might be to brilliant young minds who are aspiring uh, to um, make their own noble worthy discoveries about 
the things they should be doing to put themselves in the path of big breakthroughs and opportunities that will help the planet and humanity. Peter? Well, I mean, you know, if we want this to happen in Australia, it will happen. It will happen in China or it will happen in North America uh, where they, as Brian said, there's bipartisan support for funding science and funding strong science because they've had enormous opportunity, economic uh, development from it. So it will happen. If it's going to happen in Australia, we've got to invest a lot more money. We've got to invest a lot more in universities. And we've got to invest a lot more in the idea of positive change. I mean, you, you, it's not conservative to sit still and refuse to act in the face of a major threat. It's stupid. And basically, that's why I, this coming election is massively important. And the decisions we make now are going to have very long-term ramifications. So, quite frankly, we have to act. We have to be prepared to act and stand up and be counted. And uh, we do the best we can. So to me, education is paramount, and it's education for everyone so that you get in and you try to levelize so everyone gets a great education. I want people to reflect on education in this country. Uh, it's actually quite uneven uh, at the, you know, one-year-old to year 12. Universities actually level education in this country that has become quite... Um, uh, unleveled during, uh, you know, K through 12. So we got to get the education right because education ultimately gives everyone uh, the opportunities they need in this rapidly changing world. Undertaking, you know, uh, a degree in science or, or a trade that's technologically advanced, that is something that is going to give you the most options for this ever-changing world. Uh, and it's not just science, it's, it's, it's actually thought so anything where you learn to, to think and, and understand uh, through what I would say rational and critical thinking, those are gonna be really important skills. So it, it doesn't mean you're gonna be one thing, it means you have a whole host of things you can be and we need a world full of those types of people to solve these problems, to make sensible decisions within our democracy, but we have to get through and make sure that that early stage, the first 18 years of people's life, we get as many people leveled with education as we can. And those people, I always say, this is an amazing opportunity for you to ensure no matter what happens, you're gonna have a good opportunity and a good job going forth. And uh, the amazing thing is that if you're better educated, you live longer for quite remarkable reasons that I'm not sure I completely understand, but these things are all uh, highly related to each other. So it's a great way to, to be but we do really need to intervene, I think, in those first 18 years, better than we are. Absolutely. Here's it. Um, I, I'm going to now hand back to Brian to do a formal vote of thanks, but before we do, I just wanted to share a couple of the uh, tips that Brian had about how to win your own Nobel Prize. Uh, Professor Doherty has, of course, written a famous book about this, uh, but essentially it was, you know, go the, do the basics and do them really well, follow your passions, uh, you know, tap into the expertise of others and then to quote Daft Punk, get lucky, uh, was I believe Brian's sort of uh, rules for success. Peter's book is going to be on, store, uh, on sale up on the um, fourth, level four, I believe after this, if you want to pick up his book on uh, the year of plague living, uh, <laughs> the pandemic. Um, but would you please join me in just thanking quickly uh, Professor Brian Schmidt and Laureate Professor Peter Doherty. So before everyone goes, I, as the Vice Chancellor of ANU, would really like to thank everyone for coming out today and supporting the university uh, in its 75th year. This has uh, been certainly one of our hardest years, but I could not think of anyone more important to me than uh, Peter Doherty, uh, who has joined us, uh, as a mentor for me, and uh, certainly one of the many outstanding people that we have had at the university in our first 75 years. Uh, and so I don't know if Peter can hear us, but we can give him one more class so since he's yeah. kind of uh, zoomed out. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. And finally, Misha, uh, it is uh, always a pleasure to uh, have you involved in any of our events. Uh, Misha has a real, become a real stalwart of, I would say, the science community, making sure that we are recognized throughout Australian society for the good that we can bring, and I appreciate, as always, your efforts. Thank you, Misha. Thank you. Thank you all again, and we hope to see you around. The 75th year still has a few more months to run, uh, since why celebrate something in a day when you can spend 365 days? So. so good. Have a great Thank night. Thank you, everyone.